Uh, welcome to the HIMSS plenary session, uh, Roadmap to Success in IT Healthcare. My name is Joseph Wolfgram. I am the Chief Technology Officer for Hogue Hospital right here in Orange County, beautiful Newport Beach. But I'd like to introduce to you first our esteemed panelist, uh, who we are privileged to be spending time here with this morning. Clark Kegley, AVP of Information Systems with Scripps Health down in San Diego. Now, Clark has been with Scripps for more than 17 years which may be a record in IT, I'm not sure, I'll have to look that up. But he has led numerous initiatives, expanding and evolving technology and information uh, infrastructure there at Scripps. But in addition, he's also served as the Vice President of Administration, Chair of the High Tech Committee, and recent past president of our very own HIMSS Southern California chapter. So please, welcome Clark. I'm going to do one more introduction here, and then I'm going to let you at your slides, Clark. Thanks. Daniel Weberg is the Director of Nursing Innovation at Kaiser Permanente. You may have heard of that small organization here based in, uh, in California. Daniel was an assistant clinical professor at Arizona State University, the Health System Nursing Director at The Ohio State University, and started his own company to create and advance tools for patient simulation in nursing and nursing education. Now at Kaiser, Daniel is responsible for all eight regions, creating a sustainable technology innovation strategy for nursing and leading a broad portfolio of technology initiatives through future sensing three to five years and further out. That's a big job. Let's welcome Daniel. Now, Clark. I'd like to ask you to tell us a little bit more about Scripps and highlight some of what you would like to discuss here today on the panel, if you'd be so kind. I love the clock in the back of the room. I actually need a big display sign that says, now get up. So a little bit about Scripps Health. And I think 17 years, Joseph mentioned it, um, we're still trying to figure out what I can actually do well. So I moved from job to job at Scripps. But Scripps is a 91-year-old company in San Diego, five acute care hospitals. And those that check our website will go, but it says you have four. Two of our hospitals operate under one license. We have, uh, I always say, over 23 community clinics because we keep buying stuff. So a lot of us are on a growth pathway. We are as well. We're expanding our ambulatory practice. We've also recently, in the last 24 months, we've been very active in terms of acquisitions. And we have purchased a home health, a hospice agency, several other uh, ambulatory clinics, and so on. So we continue to grow. All the normal things that most large systems have, you can see those on the list there. It's uh, not going to bore you with all the details. One of the largest employers in San Diego County. We're a little bit under 14,000 right now. If you're in San Diego County and you're employed at all, it's us, it's Sharp, and it's Qualcomm is really the big three that are employing folks. And uh, 2,600 affiliated physicians, a little over 1,300 licensed beds, and a little bit under $3 billion in revenues. So I'm going to take a little bit different tact at this. So we heard talking about clinical informatics. As an IT guy, I like to focus on what role do we play in getting into the clinical informatics discussion. And I'm a firm believer, and I, I grew as an integration guy, so I, I trained as a programmer, discovered that I was really bad at it, and stumbled into integration. And back in the days when we called them HISs, do you remember that? Now they're EMRs and EHRs, but in the old days we called them HISs. By the way, I love Pat's comment this morning about the Hollerith cards. Anybody drop the JCL in the computer room? Go ahead, put your hand up, right? That's when we learned to swear, right? Because if you scrambled the cards, you were doomed. They wouldn't work anymore, and you had to go back and start over again, right? I actually still have, true story, a set of Hollerith cards. And just for fun, I get them out and show them to my granddaughter, who gets her crayons and draws on them, which means they won't work. So the perspective that IT, I think, should have as they approach clinical informatics is what is the clinical or business problem you're trying to solve? But even before you get to that part of the conversation, you have to be at the table. And for the IT folks who normally live under the stairs in the basement, they may be in the hospital, they may be in an administrative building, they're generally not at the table. So the first thing IT folks should be doing is get us to the table. That's where the alignment starts. And then what is the clinical or business problem that you're trying to solve? And then stop talking and listen. 
So I often go to meetings, and I don't take anything with me but my iPhone, and people often ask me that have invited me to the meeting, aren't you going to write anything down? I say, no, I'm not, because I really want to understand what it is you're experiencing, because that's how we bring solutions to bear. So from my perspective as an integrator, data with context is information. We generate a lot of data in healthcare. We don't generate as much information, and we need to get better at that. And information relates to the individual that uses the information, not to the engineer that generated it. Oh, go ahead and clap. Go right ahead. <laughs> He gets it. And too often our industry has generated information based on what we want versus what the customer wants. So it's a very different approach. Approach solutions as an IT person, as an analyst. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, back to that conversation, what are you trying to solve? Generally, technology is not the answer. In fact, most of the time, technology is not the answer. We're very good in our industry of buying something, implementing it, using 20% of it, and then wondering why we didn't get the outcomes we wanted. Familiar with that? Anybody? And then how do we solve it? We buy something else. <laughs> Just saying. Be willing to admit you don't know, but you'll get the answer. Oftentimes in meetings, I will say to people, I'm from Kentucky. You have to speak slowly and use small words. Now, before anybody that's a Wildcat fan goes a little berserk, I'm really from Kentucky. So I'm allowed to say that. Little farm outside of uh, Louisville. My parents, uh, grandparents had 1,000 acres. Go get the answer. It's okay to disagree. Don't be disagreeable. We all want the same thing, which is quality outcomes, effective patient care. We play a role. It's a very complementary role to what clinicians and others are trying to do. Strikes works is designed from your vocabulary. Oh, where do I begin? We have great engineers, great technologists at Scripps who Take the, you know, the lined graph paper that all engineers use. They go into a meeting and say, what would you like us to build? And they take copious notes, right? And then they go off and build something, and it's a terrible, awful failure. Not a bad individual or a group of individuals, but there's no alignment there. They didn't truly understand what the problem was and then how to craft a solution to solve the problem. So inevitably what happens is when they fire it up, even in a test environment and it doesn't work, the engineer goes, well, it works as designed. They get a little indignant about it, right? But you don't get it. You don't understand. So that's the alignment I was talking about before. You have to be connected to the problem. And the way to get connected to the problem is to be connected with the individual. And I often say at the beginning of meetings, everything's my fault. Let's move on. Let's just get it off the table because too often in group settings, people worry about blame, right? Get it off the table. Let's move on. So from an integration perspective, I loved Pat's slide this morning that showed a little bit about integration. We all have a spaghetti diagram, right? Right? Every one of us has a spaghetti diagram of interfaces in our system. And we call it integration. So my wife is really good about putting flowery labels on core problems. I'm not bald. I'm follically challenged. <laughs> to a kid from Kentucky, I'm just bald. So this is integration 1.0 in healthcare, right? At the very center of that wagon wheel is the big honking interface engine. And all those spokes go to a system, lab, rad, pharmacy, EMRs, et cetera, et cetera, right? And tons of data is flying around that wheel. And as we look at that problem, our solution to it is add more spokes, right? Anybody disagree? If you're doing it differently, good on you. Keep going. We're the only industry on the planet that uses interface engines the way we do. No one else does it that way. Manufacturing, finance, no one else does it that way. And as we get into data analytics and we put flowery terms on it, we start buying more and more tools, right? True story, Scripps today, right now, has 16 analytics systems, 16. So we keep adding more spokes. So how about instead of doing it that way, we do it a little bit differently. How about we evaluate each piece of data, data with context as information, treat it as an individual element, and make it available to everybody based on the needs of the user. So a finance person is going to need data presented a certain way. A CFO, a CEO is going to need data presented a different way. A nurse, a physician at the bedside is going to need it an entirely different way. How do you harness that data, make it information that's valuable to that individual with that old wagon wheel model? The model won't support it. How about if we do this? 
top part of the hourglass, and I use these actual slides when I speak to groups that don't have any concept of what interfacing or integration is, so the wagon wheel tends to resonate, so does the hourglass. Top of the hourglass is the sand that's all that data, right? It's just all clumped together, no real context. Bottom part are the consumers of that data, who if you listen and engage in a conversation will tell you how they need the data. The sweet spot in the middle is how do you make that data actionable, give it context for that end user group. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. It's good to see you guys here this morning. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm not the traditional informaticist. My PhD is actually in healthcare innovation. So anyone who wants to go that track, Arizona State, great program, go Sun Devils. So. <laughs> Um, so uh, you probably all are either competitors of Kaiser, vendors for Kaiser, are Kaiser members, so you probably know a lot about us. Uh, I updated this slide from a, a couple uh, months ago. We actually just surpassed 10 million members last month, so that's something that um, we're really, really, really proud of. But you know, we're a huge organization, 36-ish hospitals. 18,000 physicians. I like, you know, I'm a nurse, so I say we have, we actually have 50,000 nurses on staff at Kaiser, which is huge. Um, and so I get the privilege of trying to connect their ideas to IT and be that interface between uh, the two systems. So I'm like the integration broker, um, and sometimes I get overloaded and can't speak the same language and, and send my data to the wrong places. But, um, and that's I blame that on Lotus Notes because we still use Lotus Notes. So. <laughs> um, we're in uh, nine states, and um, so we're, we're just, we're really big, and we are one of Epic's first clients, so data is huge. We have um, billions and billions of points of data, and we struggled to integrate it across our regions, nonetheless our hospitals, and even within departments. So there's a lot of struggles, um, even for a large integrated system like we have. And, you know, with all this data coming in, um, it's still not contextually relevant. Uh, we have lots of points of data. We have people tracking all their steps and then saying, I want that in my medical record. But in the end of the day, does that really matter, right? I mean, the fact that you walk 10,000 steps today, is that going to change your diagnosis of heart failure? Probably not. So do we need to show the physicians and the nurses and the frontline caregivers the fact that you walk 10,000 steps? Or do we need to figure out a way to link that to an actual care outcome or a decision or a clinically relevant point? And I think that's where um, we're missing the boat a little bit um, in healthcare. So, you know, I went to HIMSS a couple weeks ago, and I saw a lot of health um, big data people. So, I, you know, I look at the trends. So I've been to HIMSS twice, only twice. Um, the first year, there were a lot of um, device people there, like the keyboards that you can wash with all kinds of, you know, agents that would dissolve, like, people. And then... <laughs> And this year, there was like five million big data companies there. And I went around to all of them, and I, I really am struggling to figure out what the differentiators are. And I think what we need to figure out is, you know, the algorithms are really the differentiator. But, the, you know, what I'm looking for is the people with a chief nurse, a chief physician, officer on their board that are making relevant da this data relevant in a way that to the end user. Not just saying, hey, look, we can make pretty graphs, but saying, hey, this is going to help you make a decision. We're solving a problem. Um, and, and I'm challenging, you know, our group too, our, our, our innovation team to say, you know, we have Epic. Um, we were one of Epic's first clients. Gotta love Epic. Um, but I'm saying Epic's just a database. There's another way to pull things above that in an application layer that we can actually make data relevant in event management systems, in integration from, you know, cl our claim systems can have connections with our care systems. That we need to go beyond the, the EMR as our only interface for our patients because it's really slow and the vendors are really slow and we need to move faster. And I think there's ways to develop faster by thinking of our EMRs as just a database and building different ways to make that data relevant. So I put this slide in just because this is all sources of different data as well as interfaces we have in our system. Um, and, it, and like I said, it's still going to people and they still have to make decisions with it. We're not helping with their decisions. So, you know, a lot of people are instituting text messaging in the clinical space, right? So now instead of calling the doctor or the nurse, I can text them. But I, that doctor or nurse still has to do something with that data, right? They still have to send it somewhere else or um, interpret it and make some sort of decision. We're not making it, making it easy. But what if you could take a text message in and turn it automatically into an order in one click instead of having to go in and log into another system and be able to do that? And so our care teams are still at the center of all this stuff. The people are still at the center. We're not making it easy for them. So, you know, when I talk to groups of nurses and informatics nurses as well, I say, you know, 
the nurses, the, there's a future of nursing is right here in technology, right? We're used to taking in all this data and making decisions off it and triaging it and making the relevant pieces out of it. And so, you know, we, we need to put clinicians at the, at the point of this data um, and, and have them represented at the table with the healthcare um, technology companies. And I sent one tweet out, only one from the uh, HIMSS conference. I said, every, and I met with tons of vendors that week. I said, the one thing that all vendors need in healthcare technology is they need a chief nurse, a chief patient, and a chief medical officer so we can actually make this stuff relevant and move faster um, instead of making these bright, shiny objects. So. And I forgot, I forgot I had this slide. So this slide I found is really interesting. I don't know how true it is, but it's really provocative. So in 2015, Uber is the largest taxi company who owns no vehicles. Facebook is the, lar is the world's most popular media owner, but creates no content. Alibaba is the most valuable retailer and has no inventory. And Airbnb is the large ac largest accommodation provider and has no real estate. So what's the future of healthcare? So I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you just a little bit about Hogue and uh, what, what my interest is here today as well. Um, Hogue has two hospitals in, uh, in Newport Beach and Irvine, an orthopedic institute, and multiple health centers and urgent care locations throughout Orange County. Our mission is absolutely how to take care of the population of Orange County. And, and uh, along those lines, we've recently affiliated with St. Joseph Hogue Health. It's uh, kind of have that footprint that we need to, to deliver the services we want to in our geography. We are a nationally recognized leader in healthcare, and that's kind of cool as a community-based hospital. But this is the thing I'm most proud of right here. Recently, like this month, our IT department at Hogue ranked number 15 in the country according to Information Week, and that's across all industries. In fact, we were awarded the number one in innovation and collaboration, beating out a small organization known as NASA. So, very proud of that. So I see some Hogue folks out here today. Make sure to update your LinkedIn profiles. Uh, so the roadmap to success in IT healthcare. Um, I believe IT is a strategic operating component. You need good governance, as you heard Clark mention. We have to be listening. We need to be better at communication, and we need to execute to expectations, right? These are basic table stakes today. We want to foster a culture of innovation. So beyond good leadership, you know, IT leaders, staff, are challenged to create trust both within IT and with IT in the business. It's not always seen as a partnership, and it really needs to be, to be effective. And we always have to be improving. There are so many opportunities to do better in healthcare IT, you know, and I love the video from this morning as well. IBM's been at this since before I've been born, and we're still working on some of those same problems today. Uh, so we can do better, and I think we're right at that tipping point where we are. One of the things I did at Hogue, and spearheaded at Hogue, I certainly didn't do it myself, is brought in virtual desktop infrastructure. Now, I've worked in other industries over my 27 plus year career in IT, and BDI, virtual desktops, don't make sense in many places. They're not inexpensive, they're not quick, they're not easy, but in healthcare, they really, really, really make sense. They fit like a glove in terms of what we're trying to do. So some years ago, we all in this room probably started transitioning from paper to electronic, CPOE, EMAR, electronic notes. It really changes the way our care providers do their work, and that's the big distinction here. It changes how people do their job. And we had to solve the issues of slowdowns to workflow. So when Hogue was getting ready to roll out some of these major modules, I had just gotten uh, to the organization uh, and some, just before some of these major um, deployments. And I looked at our desktop infrastructure and thought, oh boy, we are in trouble. We've got all kinds of computers out there, some that aren't updated, some that aren't ready. There's no standard management. There's no centralized administration. We've got a fleet of people just working hard every day to keep these things running. This is not going to bode well 
now that we're pushing everybody onto a keyboard and away from paper and pencil. For the clinician, their, their requirements are simple. I want it anywhere, anytime, instant access to all of those systems. <laughs> and by the way, don't let that technology stuff get in between me and the patient I'm providing care for. Right? That sounds pretty easy. Um, we also had to be really careful that security didn't impact the care, the performance, or the workflow. And of course, we all know the, the, what potential looming disasters any one of us can face uh, when it comes to issues of security and healthcare information. For the IT department, we're trying to build systems that are manageable, that scale with the number of users and number of applications that we bring on, that reduce the support burden so we don't have so many people fixing so many problems that cause work stoppages in clinical uh, care delivery. We want to be reliable, resilient, and recoverable. So when you look at this list of requirements, VDI does some really cool things. It puts that full desktop of applications in front of a user, usually only typing their password one time during their shift, and then have instant access uh, across practically any device they have to that desktop that they can continue working. So it does, it's worth the investment, the time, the effort, the expense, and everything else to do VDI in healthcare if you do it the right way, if you implement it with the right objectives. Um, we did do that at home. We're still in the process of it. Uh, we've got super fast roaming access, like I said, where passwords are remembered and time limits on applications are extended so you don't have to keep typing the same password into the three or four primary clinical applications you might be use, using. And we really are able to deliver an uncompromised full desktop experience, um, and now even through a simple web browser, which is kind of cool. We've enabled voice dictation and roam that session even between zero clients where there's no operating system at each of the desktops. I know I'm getting a little geeky here, but that is my background. Um, it, it, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. It gives us some seamless access to applications and resources at the local desktop where everything's running in the data center. So when you talk about security information and the risk we all have, how much EPHI are on devices right here in this room this morning, that if you left it behind or in your car if it got broken into would create a major problem, a major expense for the organization. With VDI, none of that data is on the local device. It's all within the four walls of the data center, and that's where we like to keep it. Of course, it gives you other advantages like rapid disaster recovery, and today I'm proud to say we've got over 2,500 users on VDI, thousands of desktops, laptops, iPads, and more all running on this system, so pretty proud of this accomplishment. I have to say in full disclosure, I'm not sure this is, uh, I'm not convinced at all this is why we beat NASA out, so I don't mean to imply that. Uh, but uh, that, that's some of the things that we're doing at Hogue, and there's a lot more. And this is one small piece of what's important to keep that technology out of the way of the care relationship. And it's not perfect. It's absolutely not perfect. And I think we're going to get a lot better with some of the things I hope to discuss here on the panel today. So without further ado, I'd like to get busy with the questions. First, I'd like to go to Daniel. It seems that in healthcare over these past years anyway, recent years, we're continuously expanding EMR capability. We're rolling out upgrades, we're including new features, we spend an awful lot of time and money doing it. Daniel, you see the EMR as more just a database, as you mentioned. What are the application layers that go beyond the EMR, and what should IT leaders be doing now to leverage those more effectively? So. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm, I don't know, are other people frustrated with EMR user interfaces? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so me too. So, um, you know, one of the projects that we worked on is uh, bed throughput management in one of our hospitals. So we had an innovation team go out and do design thinking, right, and figure out what the bottlenecks were. And we found out that um, the bed managers make 20 phone calls, at least, in their first hour of work. Um, and that every single point of decision is held within one or two people and a Cisco phone. And there's no transparency of data between the units. There's no transparency of data for the bed manager. The frontline managers have no idea what's happening um, in the ER versus the PACU versus whatever else is happening and where patients are moving. And so the, um, the innovation team who was trained at IDEO actually developed these um, 
pieces of, they, they, took, they built dashboards on PDF files and they manually went and got data and they'd run over to the bed manager, the nurse manager, and they'd say, hey, guess what? If you had this data, would this help your day? Like, what would you do differently? And they found they actually increased throughput um, by a lot. Uh, and so uh, this year we had a grant um, to actually build out this in, in real life. And what we did is we used the uh, Epic as a, de a database. And actually a couple systems. We used our RFID system for tracking bed and movement of where things were. We used our EMR for HL7 feeds for the ADT feeds of what, where the patients are. Um, and then we used the interface of this application layer above it. Uh, and in six weeks, which is record for Kaiser, um, developed a, um, <laughs> sorry Kaiser people, um, we, developed, we developed a user interface that was actually relevant to the end users. And we developed not only one user interface, we developed six. So we had one for the frontline nurse, we had one for the nurse manager, we had one for the bed manager, we had one for EVS, because people forget that EVS is a key to moving patients through the hospital, so we created an EVS manager. We, took, um, we were able to create a solution that instead of having a um, alphanumeric pager tell them where to go, we, gave them a, we could give them an iPad or an iPod touch that had Wi-Fi that actually dynamically prioritized where they should go clean next. Um, and we did this in six weeks and, and we pulled multiple systems into one, uh, into one layer that we built quickly using out of the box um, code and uh, technology. So, and it was in the cloud, so it was instantly scalable to mobile, to PC, all you needed was a browser and internet access. And so, I think we can do things better because we were able to design to the end user quickly and not have to rely on a very large vendor to be able to develop this in hundreds of weeks um, and a million dollar budget. And I think we can do that on certain cases, and the business case for that's huge. So we did the use case with, with the PACU, the post anesthesia care unit, $100 a minute for an OR backup, right? If the patient can't leave the OR, $100 a minute is the quote I got. So if we can save five minutes per patient over 10 million patients, I mean, the use case is ridiculous. Now, I'm not saying we have to move completely away from the EMR, but in some cases, we can go above and beyond faster and make relevant pieces, because every organization is different. Um, you, can, you can customize these things to how your workflow works, and so I think that's something that we should look at. Not to get rid of the EMR, replace Epic in any means, but to be able to move and pull these, these data points into a system, into an application layer that makes sense to the end user so they can use it for decision making. That is excellent and a great example of how involving the folks on the floor, so to speak, that are doing the work gets to the right end solution. I think we haven't done that quite enough over time in healthcare IT, and we need to do a whole lot more of it. But now, Clark, you, you mentioned that there are a lot of consumers of all of this data, and, and uh, Daniel just mentioned a, a few of them, but how, how are IT leaders going to be successful satisfying all of the various constituencies of this data moving forward? What's your plan for that? Well, that's a big question, but I think the first part of dealing with that is uh, don't assume. Um, technologists are very good about technology. Uh, for the technologists in the room, we came to healthcare because of the mission. We're not at the bedside, but our stuff is, and that's a good reason to get to go to work in the morning. You have to have those conversations, to Daniel's point. You have to go to where the work is done. Uh, you have to put your business process or clinical process hat on and not assume that you know everything that 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 clinical person does because you don't. And, and today it's more common to have folks with nursing backgrounds that may also uh, work in technology, but you're still not going to have the experience level that a bedside nurse or a physician or a tech or some other clinician is going to have. So you have to have that partnership, and that partnership has to be based on trust. So too often what happens in healthcare, and, and we're not exempt from this at Scripps either, there's a bit of an adversarial feel to the relationship. IT is going to come in and make my life harder. And you have to be able to convince your, your customers, because that's really what it is. Your patients and those taking care of your patients are your customer base. You have to convince them that we're here to help. We're not going to impose technology on you if it doesn't improve the way you do your work. Uh, from a timing perspective, I think that's a very important distinction. No IT person is going to make a nurse or a physician better. And you should never say that to a doctor or a nurse. What we can seek to do is make you faster. And that means not letting the technology get in the way. Yeah, great, great answer. I, I think that uh, we're kind of hitting on some of the key 
uh, frustrations, if you will, or um, challenges that healthcare IT has in organizations today. And I want to be sure that we're including you as the audience in this discussion as well. So be thinking about what questions you have. I want to kind of throw something out there that um, we, it was mentioned earlier, the Internet of Things, big I, little O, big T, right? And, um, you know, that's embedded electronics, software, sensors, and the connectivity involved that has the potential to bring some amazing capability in tracking, reporting, and analytics. But as Daniel mentioned, it's about getting the right information to the right person at the right time, and there's some big challenges with that. So Daniel, what impact do you feel the Internet of Things will have for healthcare delivery, and how will IT help deliver on that promise, especially as it relates to care outside the hospital walls? Yeah, so remote monitoring is huge now and all the points of data and all these things that can talk to us. We, um, we created this story because we like to provoke our organization to continue to move. So we created this thing called Imagining Care Anywhere. Um, and it's a persona uh, imagination of how all the trends in technology now might impact a hypothetical member at Kaiser. And we have one where um, it's a Medicare member who has congestive heart failure. And instead of bringing him in, so he's walking along um, doing his chores or whatever for the day out and about, um, and he's wearing a wrist monitor, and he gets a call from Kaiser saying, hey, you're breathing weird. We need to fix that. that that's from an avatar. Then the avatar calls a driverless car to come pick him up, and the driverless car is also a telemedicine vehicle that allows him to take some tests and have a teleconsult with a physician. And then from there, he gets driven to the pharmacy and takes his diuretic, and he goes home with home monitoring. He doesn't go to the hospital with pulmonary edema. That's what we can do with the, inter with the Internet of Things. We can connect and monitor people just like we do in the hospital with all this, kind all this stuff and actually keep them safer. And not only just monitoring vital signs, but in his home, we, have, we imagine that he had an Internet of Things in his home. We can control his thermostat. We can see what, what's in his fridge and tie that to his... his uh, You're his not going to bring up that <laughs> yeah. smart toilet again, yeah. are you? No, but, not the smart right. toilet yet. Yeah. But... We, his medicine is on a patch that transmits back to, and not to Kaiser potentially, but maybe to his wife who still has to work and is worried about his mental decline and can monitor him so she's at work and still you know, having to do that while he's retired and still have peace of mind of, you know what, he, he left and he came back. Oh, he took his med today. I, don't, I can remote in and see him so I'm not worried that he fell. Those are the type of things I think we can do. Um, and, and, and I think a lot of it's not to benefit the hospital side, but to really improve our caregiver sphere instead of just having the nurses and the home health aides and the PTs that go out into the home, but also enabling the care of the, uh, of the family members and helping them provide care because they're doing it 95% of the time. So I think IT can really think about those use cases and it, and it helps to put a persona on it and imagine those possibilities and take it out of what your organization can do, but maybe enabling the caregivers, the family members around. And I think the Internet of Things is gonna be really cool. That, that's, a, that's a compelling vision of the future. Thank you. I, I just wanted to add, and this does not apply at all to Daniel, who's brilliant, and, and Kaiser is brilliant in the way they do things, but for the technology side of things, if you add a D and an I to the Internet of Things, it spells idiot. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to be careful as a technologist about technology for the sake of technology. You have to have that alignment. You have to have those relationships with the business to talk about clinical process. So your example of all of those things, my three and a half year old granddaughter will probably be completely connected. My 80 year old mother-in-law, not so much. So it's, and I know Daniel wasn't implying that one size fits all, but from a technology perspective, it's multiple solutions based on the specific use case. That's a, that's a great segue. So, you know, I read something earlier uh, this week by Anthony Chang, who's an MD and Chief Intelligence and, Infor and Innovation Officer at Children's Hospital of Orange County. And he was quoted as saying, innovation in healthcare should not be technology looking for a use, but rather a smarter use of technology. So it made me wonder, does innovation require technology at all? Dr. Topol at Scripps Health argues that the ubiquitous smartphone essentially reboots how healthcare can be provided. But what about something as simple as implementing lean processes as an innovation in healthcare delivery? Does that count? Is that innovation? 
Yeah, I think I, I think technology enables innovation. I don't think it necessarily is. And I mean, I've I, I've kind of thought about it, and I have kind of a rough example. Like the iPhone is a in invention, but how people leverage the iPhone to do different things is really the innovation. So I think that's in healthcare the same way. You know that. If all the systems in IT go down, care is still going to be delivered by the frontline people. Like you know, that that's where they've been taught. That's where what they know. They don't need all the clinical systems necessarily. It'll be a little harder and slower, but they're going to still deliver care. So I think you know, for us, innovation is process. It's technology. It's all of that coming together. It's a synthesis of that, and then for an outcome. Um, so I don't think it just has to be technology. Well said. I, I would add to it that one of the great things about Lean, and we're going through that process ourselves, we refer to the whole program as value by design, is that uh, go to the customer, really go to the front lines, and learn from those individuals about uh, what they're experiencing, what challenges they have. And if you think about traditional IT, not just in healthcare, but any industry, we've never worked that way. And then too often when we begin to approach it as an industry, we swing too far in the other direction, and we take that really good pocket protector tape on the glasses engineer and we say, you're going to go see the chief nurse execs and that individual is terrified. So not everyone is suited to go out and have those conversations with frontline folks and then try to understand the problem. And innovation, uh, Eric is, Eric Topol is quite a rock star and he's always interesting to uh, listen to and talk with and Eric would be one of the first ones to say, for those that use that smartphone technology today, great, they're going to adopt that technology and use it, but again, it's not one size fits all for everyone. There's got to be multiple slices of that and not all of them include technology. Thank you, thank you very much. So I think I've demonstrated, we've demonstrated there's some, there's some definite expertise up here on the stage this morning, some great minds who have worked through some big challenges in healthcare IT. But I wanna, I wanna thank our panelists today for their courage and sharing with us honestly. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much.